So first, I would like to thank you everyone so much for coming to this incredible panel discussion that is titled Race Reductionism, the Anti-Labor Radicalism of the 21st Century. My name is Cedric Michael Simmons, and I am a PhD candidate at Boston College, as well as a diversity dissertation fellow here at IC with the sociology department and a proud alum of Ithaca College as well. The aim of this event is to foster a discussion about the concept race reductionism and how it can prevent us from understanding and addressing the sources of inequality, which include not only racism, but also exploitation and domination by the ruling class. Before we get to our amazing panelists, I would like to give a shout out to the co-sponsors of this event, provide a little bit more context and provide brief bios for each of the panelists. So we have several co-sponsors for this event. They include the Ithaca College Contingent Faculty Union, which is a part of the broader Service Employees International Union Local 200, or SEIU, the Politics Department, the Sociology Department, the Ithaca College Chapter of the American Association of University Professors, and the Park Center for Independent Media. Thank you so much for helping put together this event in such a short time frame. Also, I'd like to personally thank Dr. James Miranda, for working tirelessly to organize this event, as well as Dr. Patricia Rodriguez from the Politics Department for all of your hard work. Now, I would like to briefly provide a little context for this event. The Ithaca College community is actively reckoning with the question of how we can better understand and address racism. That is undoubtedly an indication of progress. At the same time, many of our staff and faculty colleagues are facing unemployment now or in the future. We're beginning with the premise, therefore with this event, that our urgency to address racism and other civil rights violations should be paired with an urgency to address economic inequality and labor rights violations. In other words, I believe that I can speak for the organizers of this event when I say that discussions about equity and uh, addressing inequality should begin with the premise that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, which includes the fact that most of us are precarious and working in anti-democratic organizations in this capitalist social order. This is one of the many attempts by the organizers and co-sponsors of this event to try to highlight those connections and to express solidarity with the faculty, staff, and their families who are impacted by these issues throughout higher ed. Now, I'm going to turn to introducing our esteemed panelists. Dr. Toure Reed is a professor of 20th century US and African-American history, and is a co-director of the African-American Studies Program at Illinois State University. Professor Reed's research focuses on the impact of race and class ideologies on African-American civil rights politics and US public policy from the progressive era through the presidency of Barack Obama. Dr. Reed is the author of Not Alms, But Opportunity, The Urban League, and The Politics of Racial Uplift, 1910, 1950, which was published by UNC Press, as well as Toward Freedom, The Case Against Race Reductionism, which was published by Verso Books. Our second panelist is Dr. Zine Magubani. Dr. Magubani is a professor of sociology at Boston College. Her work has appeared in Signs, Gender and Society, Political Power and Social Theory, and Current Sociology. She is currently completing a book called Sociology's Racial Ontology, Slavery, Colonialism, and the Making of a Science of Society. And finally, Dr. Adolph Reed Jr. is an American professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, specializing in studies of issues of racism in US politics. Now would add labor. He has taught at Yale, Northwestern and the New School for Social Research, and he has written on racial and economic inequality. He is a contributing editor to the New Republic and has been a frequent contributor to The Progressive, The Nation, and other left wing pub publications. He is a founding member of the US Labor Party. Now, before I get to the prepared questions, uh, I would like to remind everyone that we will have some time for questions for the, from the audience as well, and you can submit your questions for the panelists in the chat. So first, I would like to start with Dr. Toure Reed, who coined the phrase race reductionism. Dr. Reed, 
Can you talk a little bit about what race reductionism is with maybe one or two examples? And what are the consequences of race reductionism? Sure. And before I have at it, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'll, I'll just say, announce to the audience, it's great to actually see Cedric, uh, who I speak with regularly and at length. Uh, but this is our first, it's not face to face, but our first time in our Jetsons uh, type experience. So um, race reductionism, I guess to get at what race reductionism refers to, I should probably talk about class reductionism because race reductionism is kind of a response to the ubiquitous charge of class reductionism that had gained a lot of traction uh, around the, in late 2015, uh, around the announcement of Senator Bernie Sanders' plan to uh, try to win the Democratic uh, nomination for, for president in 2016. And you know, at the time in late 2015, I had thought a class reductionist, and Sanders, as we all know, was uh, regularly characterized as a class reductionist. And I, and I should say, often enough, in a way that misrepresented the failings of post-war liberalism, at least the root causes of the failings of post-war liberalism by about 180 degrees. But, but again, I mean, we know that that charge was ubiquitous, right? Uh, and has, has taken on a life of its own in many ways. And at the time, I had thought a class reductionist was someone who um, thought that racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, were either secondary or inconsequential to life chances of people, right? That, that fundamentally, um, what the obstacles that, that mattered that impacted people's lives or, or undercut their ability to progress um, came boiled down to class. And again, that racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, were secondary and consequential. And I came to realize that, that well, first, I mean, I guess such people might exist. Um, I don't know any of them personally. I certainly am not friends with them, but to be fair, one of the reasons that I might not be familiar with such individuals is I'm not on Twitter. But, uh, and that, you know, has kept my blood pressure a little lower uh, than, than it might be otherwise, and hopefully will extend my life just, just a little bit. But, but what was striking to me about the charge is while such people may exist, um, I'm not one of them, right? And I've found myself uh, and I've known lots of other people uh, who don't believe that racism, sexism, homophobia are inconsequential, right? Um, who have been charged with class reductions. I, I have argued, uh, you know, since, since I was a teenager, a long, long time ago in the, in the Reagan years, uh, for the value of affirmative action. And no one should have cared about that when I was a teen, but I've consistently argued for the value of anti-discrimination policies. I understand my parents, my, my father's here obviously, but I understood my parents to be beneficiaries of anti-discrimination policy, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, and its implications, its, its um, actualization. Uh, opened up economic opp employment opportunities for both my mother and father. Uh, my, I grew up in a black homeowner's neighborhood in Southwest Atlanta, thanks in part to the Civil Rights Act of 1968. So, and I understood myself as a trickle down beneficiary of anti-discrimination policy, the way that children uh, are vis-a-vis -vis their parents, but a real world, um, you know, a, a real time, I should say beneficiary of anti-discrimination policy because I've known racist, right? And sexist and homophobes uh, and the like. And so I've argued quite consistently um, for the value of anti-discrimination policies as one who is alive to the reality of discrimination. And yet, despite the fact that I, and I think Senator Sanders, who cares about him? He's not here now, but uh, my father, uh, Barbara Fields, uh, a host of other so-called black class reductionists are regularly called class reductionists. And what became apparent to me was that what a class reductionist was fundamentally within this charge, what the charge referred to as a kind of shotgun blast leveled at people who I would say take the social constructiveness of race seriously, who follow through on the full implications of what the social constructiveness, uh, social constructiveness of race would mean, um, but but who insist more narrowly that while racism, sexism, et cetera, impact people's lives, that anti-discrimination policies alone cannot achieve the desired end of a more just society, because black people, and that, that's who I'll I'll focus on from this point on, 
black people don't exist in a warp bubble in which time and the events in time happen around them, right? That we are human beings <laughs> like everyone else and are impacted like everyone else by political economy. And so what is necessary is not simply anti-discrimination policies, but instead, um, you know, redistributive economic policies. And this is not a, a new idea, right? The, the critics of the left critics of the war on poverty, um, obviously in the 1960s, were very clear uh, that anti-discrimination measures alone could not suffice in redressing racial inequality because race is, since it is a social construct, and I guess we'll end up exploring what that means, but since it is a social construct, what we often enough think of as racial inequalities are actually as much as anything else reflective of broad trends in American political economy that often impact Blacks disproportionately, but rarely exclusively. So again, what a race reductionist then would refer to is someone who insists that race, well, has taken on a life of its own independent of American political economy, right? And that would no longer make race a social construct. In fact, I think if you insist that racism has taken on a life of its own, own that operates independently of American capitalism. I mean, that's another way to put it if, if political economy um, seems too indirect. But, um, but, but people who insist that race operates independently and racial inequality operate independently of American um, political economy, of American capitalism, I think often enough find themselves making, reifying race, right? Um, and they find themselves uh, then staking out positions on race that are often enough and racial inequality that are not only inadequate to redress the problems that do indeed impact black people disproportionately, but, but not exclusively, but they often enough reify race. I mean, you treat race as something other than a social construct. So I think you'd ask maybe for examples of race reductionism. Yep. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of examples of it. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I'll go a counterintuitive way. So if, we, if you're clear on what it means to be a race reductionist, as, as I've defined, if that was good enough, then rather than talking about the here and now, but it does make sense to talk about the here and now, I, I want to set the Wayback Machine dial back to the 1980s and 1990s, because I think that might be even more helpful in understanding what race reductionism is and why it's problematic. And the reason I think it might be more useful to set the way back machines dial back to the 1980s and 1990s, because I suspect that we can all agree that in many ways, um, the 80s and 90s were more a more conservative time, right? In many ways, um, insofar as the 90s would represent bipartisan consensus of Reaganism, right? I mean, the 90s would, would represent the bipartisan attachment to neoliberalism uh, is another way to put it. And at that time, in this very conservative time, we witnessed a return of scientific racism um, in a variety of different forms, but in particular, the rise of something called underclass ideology. And underclass ideology is a topic that my father has written about at length. Uh, and, I, and I think I was introduced to it in high school when he had written a review of William Julius Wilson's the truly disadvantaged that I didn't read at the time. I read later, but I got to hear him complain about that book regularly uh, my junior or senior year of high school, <laughs> whichever it was. But, but anyway, underclass ideology is essentially an update of, of the culture of poverty, right? I mean, it's a culture of poverty with new window dressing, but it's essentially the culture of poverty. And so what happens in the underclass ideology narrative is that Blacks and uh, certain Hispanic populations, uh, or poor, poor African-Americans and certain Hispanic populations are alleged, passive voice, to have because of poverty and perhaps even, what would it be, systemic racism. Uh, people didn't use that term so much, but, but what we would understand to be systemic racism uh, certainly was off, often uh, part of the backdrop of what would be underclass ideology, were, um, alleged to have developed a self-defeating culture of poverty that ensured that, um, that, that was responsible for high rates of unemployment, uh, for high rates of, of crime, violent crime and property theft um, and welfare dependency and the like. And of course, 
the culture that black people, that poor blacks allegedly um, were afflicted with had, guess what, taken on a life of its own, right? So it's not actually culture at that point. If, if we understand culture to be the folks common sense basically shaped by lived experience, culture can't really take on a life of its own uh, any more than racial ideology can. But the culture had allegedly taken on a life of its own. That sounds a lot like race is what I'm saying rather than culture. And remedies, positive remedies to uh, you know, improve the lives of poor and working class blacks were really off the table, right? Because the culture had taken on a life of its own. It was essentially epigenetic. And so what do we get as a fix if, if these people are unfixable because they, because they are um, essentially a, a subracial category. You don't get anti-poverty programs. You don't get jobs programs like one would have, would have expected during, the, or people got, I should say, during a new deal, or even job training of the sort that we got out of the war on poverty. Instead, we got more prisons, more federal funding for prisons, a push to extend incarceration, uh, length of incarceration, right? Mandatory minimums and the like, destruction of public housing um, because public housing was the nest in which this, these, this pathological culture, you know, uh, uh, ran rampant, right? Um, and lots and lots of other draconian welfare reform, et cetera, lots of draconian policies because what was going on, one of the things that was going on anyway, was a form of race reductionism. The problems that impacted Blacks disproportionately in that era impacted poor people, right? And Black people were overrepresented among what they call poor people. Um, there was a strong correlation between poverty. Well, first, there's a really strong correlation between low wages and unemployment and poverty, right? So even talking about this in terms of poverty is maybe giving the devil too much ground, but I'll, I'll do that for the sake of a of a sympathetic audience. But there's a strong correlation, of course, between poverty uh, and violent crimes and property theft. And so if Black people are overrepresented among poor people, then it should be no surprise that Black people would be overrepresented among perpetrators of violent crimes and, of course, property theft. And that, of course, is one of the factors that went into then Blacks' overrepresentation among the inmate population. So I, I wanted to play with that more conservative time because I think it made, made sense or makes sense to stress the profoundly negative implications of the race reductionist framework first, because at this moment, race reductionism, I think many of us sort of reflexively and understandably equate with a case for inclusion because it's baked into diversity discourse, right? I mean, as Cedric and I have discussed many times. Um, but if you tease it out, you can see the dangers associated with insisting that culture or ideologies can take a life of their own because it no longer treats something that's a social construct or it no longer takes um, ills, societal ills that are the consequence of human invention, right? Um, human intervention, social relations, I should say, um, as the product of social relations, but rather they become essentially innate right, through some often enough unspecified process, but more and more it seems that people are moving from mysticism to epigenetics on this one. So um, I know I went on for a bit and I should probably just shut up on that question. I'm not sure if I answered it fully. No, you did, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and, and what you said definitely uh, leads directly into my next question, uh, which is throughout higher ed and in broader political discourse, um, it is fashionable to talk about African-Americans and even white Americans, or as the field sisters say, Euro-Americans as cultural groups. For example, whenever you hear someone talk about the value of diversity, we often hear that African-Americans have cultural differences that should be celebrated and recognized as valuable for a school or business as a whole. And in your book, you take that line of reasoning to task. Since it may be hard to see why that's a problem, can you highlight some of the issues that arise when we say that race refers to groups, not only uh, cultural groups, but cultural groups with the same material interests. Sure. So one way that I think it might make sense to explore this question 
Uh, and, and Cedric, as our moderator is aware of this, of course, no surprises for him, is I've got a couple clips that I would like to show if our moderator can show them. And they're each about 30 seconds long. Uh, and um, so Cedric, would you mind if, if, if you are so inclined or <laughs> uh, yep. showing the, the clips in the appropriate order? Yes, one second. Sure, and after the first one, I want to ask the audience, I want to interact with the audience a bit before we show the second one. Okay, one second. Okay. Greatness lives within all of us. And with Ancestry DNA on sale for just $69, now is the time to discover yours. You can find out where you get your precision, your grace, your drive. And now, with more than 150 ethnic regions to connect to, only Ancestry DNA can put your greatness on full display. Save 30% now at AncestryDNA.com. So, um, and can we go back to gallery view? Yep. One second. So audience members, uh, hopefully you watched that. Um, what's, what struck you about that clip? <laughs> Actually, I'll lead you. What's wrong with that clip? What's scary about that clip? Uh, we're connecting ability, capacity, skills, um, like grace with ethnicity, with, yeah. with a location, yeah. Okay, that was great. Um, I'm satisfied with that one. Does anyone disagree? Now, when I, in the uh, document that I sent Cedric, just to put this into perspective, I titled that one Hitler on Ice. So we've all decided that Hitler on Ice is, uh, it's a Mel Brooks reference, if you don't know, and I think we all got the Hitler part. But um, we, we have all agreed that one of the things that's transparently or the thing that's transparently problematic about that Ancestry DNA ad is that it connects ability, capacity to one's, um, you know, heritage, right? Um, and to one's genes, essentially, to location. By the way, I mean, they're blurring the line between what ethnicity is and what race is supposed to be. But, you know, we could quibble over the significance of that, I suppose. So cool, we all think that's evil, fine. So Cedric, would you mind showing the second one? Which is also just 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Your foremothers, your society was led by a woman who governed thousands, commanded armies, to no one. When I found you in my DNA, I learned where my strength comes from. My name is Courtney McKinney, and this is my ancestry DNA story. Now, with two times more geographic detail than other DNA tests, order your kit at ancestrydna.com. So, Cedric, can we go back to gallery view? Absolutely. So, that, that's my full bag of tricks by the way, for, for videos and, and the like. So, hey, what's the difference between those, those ads? I mean, if you take diversity, equity, and inclusion off the table, right? What's the difference between those ads? I'll tell you what I'll answer, nothing. It's the same damn thing, right? And so what's dangerous about this approach is that you know the way that we talk about often enough diversity, um, let's say, equates culture with race, right? Just like ancestry DNA does. Oh, just like Nazis too. Oh, I forgot about them for a second. But it but equates, again, diversity with a genetic or a culture and perspectives and ability with genetic capacity, right? Or, or, or heredity, I should say, with, with heredity. Um, and that's if you think about the way that people talk about diversity specifically, and I, and I should say this, um, and then I'll shut up, uh, I swear. I have believed in diversity 
as a construct since I first learned of that, um, which would take me back again to the Reagan years when I was, was in high school. But the interesting thing about it is the notion of diversity that I had embraced um, up and, and still do for what it's worth is very different from the dominant notion of diversity. I had embraced diversity, a notion of diversity that's kind of more like something on the spectrum. And I, I, I should probably not say this, but I will. But something that's more like on the spectrum of Chicago ethnic cycle theory, except, you know, I, the biological metaphors and the cycle thing, I reject that part. But the basic idea that the differences between people aren't real, right? They're, they're cultural. And that contact between, you know, different ethnic groups, if you will, or cultural groups makes that plain and is essential, basically, to um, dismantling prejudice, that contact between different, you know, ethnic groups or whatever you'd want to call them is a necessary task to, to dismantle prejudice, right? Because that would make plain over time that differences that we understood to be baked in really weren't. So that is the notion of diversity that I had long embraced. And then about a decade ago, I started serving on diversity task forces. And I realized that the notion of diversity that I had embraced, which I still do, is not what diversity means, but instead that diversity means something very compatible with the ancestry DNA ads, right? That we have all agreed suck um, or are perhaps evil, um, which is what I would call them. Insofar as every within the heart of every black American, let's say, um, courses the blood of their ancestors and, uh, and of course their compatriots, right? Their ethnic compatriots so that one black person can actually serve as a representation representative for 40 something million black people, right? Um, and you know, whatever their, their sex, um, one woman, whatever her race might serve as a proxy for, you know, half the U S population, right. Et cetera. And again, I mean, it's a, even as the end is diversity, it, even as the end of that model of diversity is inclusion, which I certainly embrace too, how we get there is embracing racism. And the last thing, a racist reification of race, which is how I would define what, what racism is. So the last thing I'll say on this front, just to tie this again to the horror show that is, is how we think about race um, and culture at this point. And we obliterate the distinction between what culture is and what race is, is supposed to be. I don't watch live action superhero stuff, as Cedric knows. I do do the cartoons but um, I won't outgrow the cartoons. But the live action stuff is pure fascism all the time and I can't do it. But a friend of mine told me recently, a colleague of mine had suggested that I check out The Watchmen, the TV show, uh, not the movie, because um, it features, one episode features the Bureau of Reparations, which is headquartered in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in order to determine who qualifies for reparations, uh, subjects, must take a DNA check, a cheek swab uh, to prove that they are, you know, deserving of reparations. And I'm sorry, I'll just, I'll end on a provocative note. I think that we've seen this before, right? With a different end. And previously that train literally ended in Auschwitz, right? Literally. Um, I'm horrified, I'm frightened by the extent to which, and this is why I had Cedric show those ancestry DNA clips, the extent to which what is in effect Nazi ideology, right? Which to be fair to the, the Nazi, the German Nazis, they got it from Americans and the Brits. So they didn't come up with it on their own, but, um, but we have repackaged what is in effect, the ideology of Nazism as a, as a gift for dad for Father's Day. Um, and this does not bode well. Right. So there, if I've answered the question sufficiently, I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Magubani. So in your work, you have also talked about the role uh, that sociology has played in the construction of race as a reference to cultural groups. You write that it is a uniquely American sociological formulation. Can you talk about that history, its ties to slavery, and how we should think about race instead? Sure. Thank you, Cedric. 
So um, if you'll also indulge me in a way back machine, I want to take us even further back than the 1980s to 1896. And I'm going to take you back to a speech that Booker T. Washington gave that's famously now called the Atlanta Compromise Address. And that speech has, is popularly understood as where he said a really famous thing is that blacks and whites should be as separate as the fingers on a hand when it comes to industry, uh, to social things, but then can be one, you know, to do work type of things. Basically, it's, it's, it's often seen as the speech where what is most important about it is supposed to be that he said that African Americans are only good for you know, work in factories and mines, not for the higher pursuits and things like that. All good and well, that is true. But what is less known about the speech is, first of all, who he was speaking to was at this uh, event called the International Cotton uh, Exposition. And he was speaking to an audience of the largest interests, capitalist interests in cotton, railways, and things of the nature. And he said, which I'll just read to you very quickly, he said, so he's very famous for having said, cast down your buckets, cast down your buckets where you are, meaning stay in the South. And he says, so he's like, now I'm gonna talk, I've talked to you workers, I'm gonna talk to employers. And he says, cast down your buckets among the eight millions of Negroes who ha whose habits you know, whose fidelity and love you have tested in days and when it, which have proved to be tre treacherous. Cast down your buckets among these people who, and this is the important part, without strikes and labor wars have tilled your fields, cleared your forests, builded your railroads and cities and brought forth treasures from the bowels of this earth and helped make possible this magnificent re representation of the progress of the South. So uh, it is oftentimes that we think about the era after slavery within a framework of race relations, that it was an effort to reinstantiate right, white supremacy. What we don't often think about Booker T. Washington, who I think is one of the founders of sociology because of his relationship to a person I'll get to in a minute, this guy, Robert Park, we don't often think about that period after slavery as also being riven with class conflict and with the active destruction of a movement called the populist movement. A movement that was not, did not situate itself specifically about the achievement of racial equality, but rather spoke to the economic arrangements of the society. The populist movement was considered so threatening that even the New York Times wrote, when the emancipated slaves, when the farmers were talking about possibly seizing the plantations and dividing them up amongst the workers, they said, this has gone too far. This is striking at the roots of capital, the relations between capital and labor itself. So the only second thing I will read to you. So the New York Times says, um, the proposed confiscation strikes at the root of all property rights in both sections. It concerns Massachusetts quite as much as Mississippi. So Booker T. Washington is speaking to a crowd in the context of the destruction of a movement that was, again, not simply about racial equality, but about questioning the economic arrangements, the property relations within American society. It's also a time when there is this asset, a, a rising to prominence of Northern capital and the Southern economy is supposed to be hitched onto that as sort of the producer of raw materials, right? So there's a whole political economy at stake. So Booker T. Washington, puts forward this idea about you know, the fundamental way to understand American society, however, is of a question of race relations rather than struggles over property relations. And this is important for sociology, why? Because it is through sociology that we get a number of analytics. The whole notion of the sociology of something called race and ethnicity, or the labeling of what is going on as race relations. This is something that sociology, this is the framing of the, of the problem from sociology that is lifted directly out of Booker T. Washington's way of framing the essential problem of the South at the time. So how does Booker T. Washington's framing become imported into sociology? It is through his relationship with a man called Robert Park, who's um, the founder of, one of the founders of the Chicago De Department of Sociology, which is the the big deal department of sociology for people who are not sociologists, right? It is at, so at Chicago that 
sociology is properly understood to have moved from a sign of a, 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 a sort of mixed bag of reform efforts to become a true science. It had become such when Robert Park writes this book called Introduction to the Science of Sociology. This book is so important that it is literally called the Green Bible because the cover of the, the book is green, right? So, Booker, so where, how does Robert Park end up at, at Chicago? He gets to start rather humbly. He meets Booker T. Washington in an advocacy organization called the American Congo Reform Association. Um, he meets him, they, they, he, and Booker T. Washington brings on as you know, a ghostwriter, personal secretary, and a person who is working quite closely with him on the what is called Negro education in the South. And how it is billed, it is never billed as an accommodation to a capitalist system. It is billed as Negro education to quote, accommodate the Negro to his place in life. So the, the framing of the problem is fundamentally racial and about the management of the re relations between the races is there at its center, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a subtle shifting of the problem or, or of the definition of the problem. So Robert Park spends a number of years working with Booker T. Washington. In 1912, they give a huge conference called the International Conference on the Negro, where colonial officials come from all over. They come from South Africa, they come from Jamaica, they come from Britain, and missionaries to talk about the, quote, management of the race problem in all of their societies. Of particular interest are South Africa and the American South. And it said, because there, white and black are both, are, are both laborers. Um, instead of a society like J Jamaica where, you know, capital is white and labor is black, that here they say a unique problem in so-called race relations arises. So here we have again, the reformulation of a problem that, that, that lies quite fundamentally in the political economy of the society and a recasting of it as a problem of race relations between groups. Robert Park even basically rewrites the history of slavery such that it appears that slavery is a mechanism for the management of the different temperaments of the races, as though, again, slavery was in the business of producing white supremacy rather than cotton and sugar and indigo and so forth. Right? So anyone who wants to you know, read about this period of history, it's been written about far better than I ever could by you know, Judith Stein, best article, best essay probably ever written on Booker T. Washington called a book of Booker T. Washington and others. Also a great book on the populist movement, simple title, The People Know by Thomas Friend. So what happens is that, that Robert Park at this international conference, he meets a group of Chicago sociologists who then say, you must come to Chicago and give courses on the race problem. He's going to the University of Chicago, which is of course owned full tilt by the Rockefellers. So what we have in sociology is almost a magician's trick whereby a couple of things happen. First of all, something emerges, which is called the sociology of race relations. And I'd like to start there with the word race. Barbara Fields, a far more brilliant woman than I, has identified one of the most important conceptual slips that sits not only at the heart of our popular discourse, but most importantly for us as sociologists in our disciplinary architecture, which is called the race racism evasion. Simply put, it is the naming, the word race, she said, is a neutral signing, sounding word with the ugly process of racism smuggled and hidden inside of it. When sociologists put forth they're going to study race or say how race impacts something, what they are doing, it's a hidden mechanism. It's not only the ugly word racism hidden inside, but it is actually only naming one mechanism that produces inequality, which is discrimination, which Torre has talked about beautifully at length. So what sociologists, when they say the study of race or when they say race and class, they are basically saying race equaling both the ascriptive or demographic description of a person, their race, their census category, and also smuggled and hidden in there, discrimination as the explanation for how inequality arises. All right, so how then does sociology, we've got one word race, the sociology has then posited race and class as sort of ex explanatory alternatives to one another, right? 
So how do sociologists understand class? Well, even back then, Booker T. Washington and Robert Park had an understanding of class, but class was only an ascriptive or demographic attribute of an individual. Hence, even in sociological studies, it's called socioeconomic status. Class as we, as Marxists understand it, of course, is a social relation. It's not an ascriptive description of, per, of a person. So what we have in sociology is race understood and one, one as an ascriptive attribute, but also a mechanism of discrimination and class pretty much only as an ascriptive attribute. In other words, there is no analysis of property relations whatsoever in, in the standard sort of sociology of race. Um, it is merely class as yet another attribute of a person. So how does that, if we move forward a little bit in time, how does that impact popular discussions of race, race as they appear sort of in media, in popular understandings, and even really in our policy frameworks? It, it, it shows up as a way of, so it shows up most, uh, most familiarly in the invoking of something called structural racism. So if we could, if we wind back the rollback machine a little bit from 1896 and root it in eh, 1960s, 1970s. All right, so from the original Robert Park formulation, which when you have this notion of um, uh, races as, well, even in the Booker T. Washington formulation itself, Booker T. Washington was properly understood as a race leader. Well, what does that mean? race leaders, unlike other kinds of leaders, are never elected by anybody, right? So if you're a leader of a country, a whole bunch of people have voted for you. If you're a race leader, elites have appointed you to be that. So Booker T. Washington understood as the race leader, and he puts forward this idea of race relations, which is essentially a racial, a racial back and forth between the elites. How does this translate into sociological discourse? It translates into something called attitude studies. So in the first wave of sociology, when people sought to understand the role of so-called race in society, the idea was that you asked a bunch of people there's something called their racial attitudes. That ended up in questions like, would you like your daughter to marry one? How would you feel if one moved next door? What do you think about the Negro? And then they would, they would gather all the opinions together and lump them and say, the attitude of America were towards the black man is X and Y. And that attitude, it was imagined that all those attitudes group together and then they create a collective conscious or a collective action. And because people don't like other people, they close off opportunities, right? So that was the, it was a, that was the first iteration of a sociological analysis. It progressed and became only so much slightly better when it was recognized that, well, racism is not just something that adheres in the hearts and minds of individuals. Sociologists realized, well, you know, and especially after the, the, the fall of, uh, you know, legalized discrimination and so on and so forth, and people start to answer attitude surveys in the right way. I don't mind black people, they're nice people, so forth. But, and then the question becomes, how do we still have such an unequal society when the, when the laws have changed and people's attitudes have changed? So sociology does a little bit of about face and says, oh, we understand why, because it's not just individuals, it's in, and here are the big buzzwords, structures and institutions. However, even though the word structure and institutions are invoked, they are invoked absent any class analysis of what are the property relations that gave rise to those structures and institutions. Because in our way back machine, we also have to see that this discipline, like all, went through the Cold War, where any form of class analysis that suggested that the economic arrangements, who owned what, who worked for who, how much power did workers have, that must be evacuated not only from politics, but from the analysis of society. So what you end up with is all the right words being said, because the holy trinity in sociology is race, class, and gender, but it is class as an ascriptive attribute and not any kind of analysis of property relations. What that gets you is a structural theory without a structure. Class analysis, class in sociological discourse, again, as it shows up as structural racism, institutionalized racism, intersectionality, when they're like, all three are important, it really boils down in that analysis, even though all the words are right, 
class ends up being looked at either as an ascriptive uh, attribute or an identity, just as race and gender are. So that the problem being there though is the race and the gender are the, the mechanism that's imagined to work, I suppose, is discrimination and class is imagined to have no mechanism whatsoever. Therefore, what you get when the institutional racism types and the structural races, the intersectionalities, even when they say class, how they get to, the, to, to a reaffirming race reductionism is they say things like this. Well, even middle-class black people get followed by the police. Um, you know, uh, uh, Joy Reid famously said, well, Sandra Bland had a college degree. So I don't really see all of you people who think, you know, class is the answer. It's actually race. So that whole entire formulation and how that gets reiterated and how class can be invoked again and again, such that, again, we get called these sort of reductionists. They are not saying that they think class is not important. They think they've got it all figured out, that they have actually incorporated class. And it is we who don't understand what's going on because you know, even middle-class black people get harassed by the police or, or so on and so forth. Or, you know, and I'll, I'll leave this to Adolf because he's done it a lot better than I, the disparities framework that constantly reproduces the idea that, uh, you know, ultimately, Yes, we, there's all of this, you know, some things are explained by how poor people are, but really discrimination is the overriding mechanism because rich and poor black people suffer equally, right? So, so, so sociology, I think, bears a particular responsibility because sociology was the discipline that from its inception was really the study of this so-called race relations. There's a great book by Stanford, Stanford Lyman called The Black American and Soci Sociological Thought. The best line from that book is to trace the history of the black men in sociology is to trace the history of the discipline itself. In seeking to run away from what has actually been the core of our discipline, which is on the one hand, so-called race relations, and on the other hand, something called charities and corrections, which is really the disciplining of poor people, those two things are the center of our discipline. That is something that which cannot be named. It must be, to quote the postmodernists, put under erasure. Instead, we talk ourselves, we say to ourselves, we are studying some abstraction called society. Um, when in actuality, this, this, this is the bread and butter of our discipline. And we can see that most of the concepts that inform everyday speech and everyday understanding from the race relations framework to the positing of race and ethnicity, even what the th of what those two things are made. We imagine that race uh, refers to the so-called biological differences between people and ethnicity somehow refers to their cultural or background. But again, they're actually, in order to hold that analytic um, for it to have robustness, race must be biological, which we all know that it is. The whole race and ethnicity conceptual architecture is built upon the idea that race is biological, which has been thoroughly refuted. So that, that architecture is the center of our discipline. All of our courses are called race and ethnicity. And when people speak popularly or the beautiful video, the beautifully terrifying video that Ture just, that just showed rests upon that fundamental idea. So really our disciplinary architecture has provided a lot of the common sense thinking that is extremely wrong. It has also provided a lot of policy direction that suggests that the most important way to achieve a just society is the elimination of disparities. So in Booker T. Washington's day, it was racial adjustment was the, was the name of the game. Then it became um, racial assimilation. Right now we're in the era of diversity and inclusion. All of those things, the fixing of the problem always leaves the existing property relations of the society absolutely intact. They are attenuated to the absolute point of disappearance, no matter how much words like structure or institution or institutionalized uh, are, are invoked again and again. So I think I've come to the end of my time and I'll turn it over to, my, to our final speaker. Thank you so much.
Um, sometimes I wonder if uh, Barack Obama, when he shut down the protests from the NBA players or the, the boycott or the strike, sorry. Sometimes I wonder if he, uh, if he gave his own rendition of the cast down your bucket speech to LeBron. But anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's turn to uh, uh, doc, the elder Dr. Reed. Um, so let me just say, this is so awesome. I just, this is so awesome that I'm doing this. All right, <laughs> now we're doing this. All right, uh, Dr. Reed, in recent years, you have called upon leftists to recognize the limits of bourgeois anti-racism in the United States. Specifically, you have repeatedly argued that anti-racism is not an alternative to a class politics, but it is actually a class politics. It is the politics of the professional managerial strata and it is the left wing of the neoliberal consensus. For those who aren't familiar with this argument, what do you mean when you say it is a class politics? Why do you believe that it is the politics of the PMC as opposed to the working class? And why is it so hard for many to see the relationship between capitalism and racism, particularly in the academy? No, that's a great question. And, and uh, before I answer it, well, I'll give one, one very quick and, um, and an overarching answer. Uh, but, but then I want to uh, you know, digress for a second. Um, I say that uh, because the tendency in political science, well, it's not really political science, but uh, you know, the tendency in a study of society that I've, 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 I've been invested in for as long as I've paid attention to it uh, is anchored by Marx's understanding of politics, which boils down to asking the question, cui bono, who, uh, uh, who benefits? And when you look at what's been designated as the black political agenda, like over the last half century at this point, uh, and ask that that question, well, you you see that that specific class strata um, um, within the black population get the goodies, and the rest of the people don't. But if I can have my uh, you know digression just for a second here, absolutely. Uh, because, uh, yeah, two things. One is, I was going to say, there's really not nothing left to say after my predecessors, uh, but I also cannot wait to see uh, um, Dr. Uh, Magubani's book, right? I'm going to um, be, be, uh, be waiting with bated breath till it comes out. And the other thing I wanted to say, just to, um, so um, shortly, before I logged on, um, I watched um, a brief um, um, interview with uh, the late Michael Brooks, right? Um, um, who was a towering um, public intellectual, right? I don't like to use that term, but he really was one who, who, uh, who, who was taken from us much too early. And um, his clip um, uh, reminded me of um, Mahmoud, Mamdani's great book on the Darfur fantasy and and the problem and how human rights in imperialism um, uh, in inclines toward um, in toward inflating um, you know the currency of genocide right so so like everything's a genocide and watching um, just in the past week uh, this recent um, uprush, right, uh, or punctuation point in the slow genocide going on in Palestine that no one wants to call, call by its right name is really irksome. And I urge us all to reflect on that. And, and uh, because Michael Brooks said, you know, an apartheid state is an apartheid state. Punto. Fin. Nada más. OK, sorry. So I'll get off my soapbox. Or I'll get off that soapbox now, maybe get on to another one. Um, but really, like the first, um, my, my quip answer is, I mean, the answer, right? It's a matter of looking at what the content of what gets um, characterized as, as, as the Black agenda, and by extension, as uh, black, black politics tells you, right, um, uh, why it's a class politics, right? Uh, during the Sanders campaign and, and and, and and I laud uh, you know, Professor Mangubani for for smacking one of my favorite targets, jo Joanne Reed, uh, who, who kept kept saying that uh, I mean, she, she she did this classic interview with, with um, um, 
um, like the Daily Show guy, Tre Tre Trevor. Uh, Trevor Noah. Noah, thank you. I wanted to call him Trevor Howard. That's like an old <laughs> Brit actor. Uh, but uh, and it shows how much I watch him. But 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 in this interview, right? She actually said that um, black people uh, wouldn't benefit from, don't have any interest in Medicare for all or in in free public higher education. Why? Because what? Because what she said black people wanted was a reckoning. And people like she and Tony Coates want a reckoning. People who worry about their sick kids getting treated at a hospital want Medicare for all. Um, so I guess that's that's really, I mean, uh, um, I don't know that it's simplistic, but but like that to me is the simple response to why I say that that um, race or that what we understand to be race politics and and I mean, Toure has even gone gone farther than this and advised uh, the, Sander, uh, the Sanders campaign before they hit the ground for the second uh, um, uh, run that that the idea of focusing on 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 black politics was a mistake because black politics is it it it, it, it is it is this program uh, and ideological complex that that skewed entirely toward uh, to, toward toward the project of making rich black people richer, right? And again, that's it. So I guess that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, but I'm feeling I'm just along for the ride anyway, because because the other two folks have done the heavy lifting. So this is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna I have one last question um, uh, to ask the three of you, um, and I know that I've talked about this a little bit with um, uh, Dr. Torre and Dr. Zine, um, but what is one piece of advice that you would have for undergraduate and graduate students as we navigate a terrain? where racism is rightfully acknowledged as a problem that needs to be addressed, but racism, race reductionism is constantly promoted by the ruling class, many professionals, and many managers, and there's so much hostility um, to a Marxist analysis. And uh, let's start with, uh, let's go with the reverse order and start with the elder Dr. Reed. Dr. Okay. Well, um, as you might imagine, from time to time, I've, I, I've had the occasion to talk with students outside the classroom who have expressed some interest in you know uh, our kind of activism or like going into the labor movement or whatever and the first piece of advice i give them is that like this isn't like you can't go into this thinking like you know ngo right um and uh and you can't and what that means among other things is you can't uh, um, be flexible enough to define victory as what well, whatever happens to you and what you get, right? So, so what that means is that, um, you know, the only way you can do it and stay sane um, and like do it for the long haul is to adopt the mindset of a major league baseball player where it, if you're successful three times out of 10, you go to the hall of fame because when, when you're it, it engaged in a project that by its very nature is directed toward challenging ruling class power, you're gonna lose more then you win. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is, and, and I stress this too, like it's so important to be involved in collective processes, right? Because um, uh, uh, especially um, you know, for those people who've gone to fancy schools like, like yours, right? Uh, but um, the main skill that you learn there is to bullshit yourself about what you're doing, right? I mean, to convince yourself that that whatever move you make, uh, wh whether or not it advances your personal interests, right, is the historically appropriate move to make, right, and 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 like this comes through in a lot of ways, um, and uh, like among them is um, is uh, um, you know the notion of doing well by by doing good, right. Uh, that can sometimes be the case, but you know, I don't want to be the person who's put in charge of determining whether my my uh, motives are genuine or honest or uh, effective. Right, uh, right. I spent too much time as a kid kneeling in an empty church 
uh, examining my conscience while waiting to uh, you know, go into the confessional uh, to, to, to know that, that, that you can't trust yourself, right? Um, and plus, I mean, um, um, uh, the key line from the, the old, uh, from the old labor song, Solidarity Forever, is yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one. You can't do anything by your damn, damn self anyway. And, and that's another marker of how what, what we think of as a movement has changed. About a decade or so ago, uh, the nation uh, did a, a feature on uh, 10 youth activists whom they were honoring, right? And like seven or eight of them started an NGO. And one of them was a young woman who like carried a bullhorn around with her because she was cause just, just in case the demonstration broke out. But um, so, so I guess I would say um, that politics isn't really about demonstrating your purity. It's about having vision and objectives and trying to mobilize human and other I mean, resources to pursue those objectives. Right, um, and um, as far as the Marxism thing, thing is, is a concern, question is concerned. You know, I've long said too that I mean, as between people who get their politics or their radical politics from books, and people who get their politics from a visceral hatred of capitalism, I'm um, I'm putting my money on the second person every time, right? Because because the, the bourgeoisie's always got a better idea to offer you, right? Uh, and convince you that this is what, what the world really needs, right? Microfinance, for instance, and or um, and uh, and 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 all those ex Trotskyists who became neoliberal finance ministers in in in, in uh, structural adjustment governments in in, uh, in Latin America. So anyway, I mean, does that get it uh, or clo close enough to what you? Uh, yeah, we're going for. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, it reminds me of um, the uh, I think the quip that you said your father um, or the definition of ideology that your father told you is that ideology is the mechanism that harmonizes uh, the principles or the values that you believe you hold yeah. um, with your material interests. That's uh, it. Just yeah. brilliant. <laughs> um, so let's. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the other two panelists to answer the same question, but uh, we're going to try to uh, bring it to the audience for questions as well. Um, hopefully at around seven ten. So um, quickly, uh, what advice would you have for for students who have to navigate uh, this terrain? And then Dr. Magabani. Okay. Well, it's. I always give people this example. If we were to go in the wayback machine back to the time of slavery with our current imagination of how we, how we make a more equitable society. The trainers and consultants would say this, we must empower more black women to become slave owners because <laughs> they used to be slaves and they will understand the lived experience of slavery and they will be more kind and humane slave owners. In the interests of equity, we must open up, not only black men and women should be owned, but everybody should be owned. Black women, and they would say the height of achievement, and this person might even make it on AM Joy or, or, or the, the readout. <laughs> it's the first black woman they need to be eliminated, right? They, they're not to be made more equitable. And so that's how I always start them because they always startle a little bit at that um, example. And since we don't have so much time and I wanna leave for questions, I'll just leave it at that provocative example. Thank you, Dr. Reed. And I just co-sign Zinni's assessment because I think that's spot on and it's hard to follow that because what else is there to say? Um, I'll, the only thing I can add to that, and it's just a, it's the low rent version of that point, which is um, empathy, right? I mean, I, I think we need, one of the nice things about going to a doctoral program in history is that, you know, you learn historicity, right? And one of the things that that, that training entails is that it discourages students or, or budding historians and then historians from projecting the values of their moment back in time to the best of their abilities, right? And that requires that one view one subject kind of through the lens of empathy, but not sympathy. Uh, specifically, you have to take the time to understand why people at a given point in time 
looked at the world the way that they did. You can't just say, my God, how could they be so stupid to have believed A, B, C, or D, which by the way, is I, my first year in college, I called my dad regularly and said, my God, how could these people be so stupid? <laughs> they believe this crazy shit that they believed in, you know, 1895, right? <laughs> Whatever, right? <laughs> but that's obviously, the, well, it's not obvious. That is the wrong way to look at it. Um, and the reason I, I suggest that empathy is important is, well, just think back to the last four years. It's not enough for us to say that they, these people who are racist, um, they're just not like us as people who are educated at fancy Edu uh, fancy colleges and universities often do. They're not like the rest of us, right? They're in flyover country. Uh, and so we will never connect to those people. They're, you have to under take the time. We have to take the time. If we don't want a worse repeat of 2016 or January 6th or whatever, to try to make sense of why people look at the world differently than us. And, um, and that's part of the problem with imagining that racism is one's original sin, right? Or thinking about racial groups, not as ascriptive categories, but as, as identity groups, because that takes, if you treat racial groups as identity groups, then you take what is an ascriptive and external category or external framework, and you make it internal, which once again is what's the word racist in the true sense of the word. So um, empathy is what I'm gonna, is, is, is the watchword there um, and I'll shut up. Robin D'Angelo, if she was here right now, she'd be so mad. She'd be like, no, you're supposed to embrace her racial identity, whatever the hell that means. <laughs> I would tell her to watch some Miss Morello clips, clips on uh, YouTube. Because <laughs> that's kind of who she is, it seems, right? I'm not so either way. Ever. Best sitcom here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists for, for, um, for all of your help with um, helping us make sense of the relationship between race, re race reductionism and capitalism. And now we get to uh, get to the questions from the audience. So I'd like to turn it to James um, to help us facilitate um, um, those questions. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Cedric, thank you to you for putting all of this together and making it happen and, and structuring the whole thing. Um, and thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I knew I was immediately out of my league when, when Toure asked what was wrong with the first video. I said, she really bungled that triple axel. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna move into uh, some questions from, from the audience here. And um, I, I thought what we could do uh, just in the interest of time and to be somewhat equitable is that um, folks could to type their questions in the chat. Um, and if you wanted to, uh, I'm gonna go to the first questions that have come up already. Um, but if you wanted to, just to identify yourself uh, as a student or faculty or community member, um, just so we try to get some, some questions from different folks. Um, and and we'll, you know, we'll go through some of the questions that came in first. Um, and in the, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna read them too, uh, just so that we can have the panelists speak to them. But I'm gonna start with uh, Maribel Taneo's question, which came in uh, a little bit earlier, that uh, asks, um, how uh, would the, the panelists, uh, she says, so my question to the panelists would be, what explains the finding that college educated folks are more likely to subscribe to identitarian politics than less educated folks? I should say in the interest of time, we'll probably do one, maybe one, quick, uh, one or two quick responses um, to each one. Does that sound good with the panelists? Okay, awesome. Well, um, I mean, I'd say uh, the short answer is, uh, yeah, they are more, uh, more in, in, or college educated people, and especially people at fancy colleges are more, um, I mean, likely to um, go for identitarian stuff. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. Um, but one of them is that there's a material foundation for it, um, you know, within the class. Um, and um, they've uh, they're 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 more uh, they're more likely not to have been distracted by the need to make a living. Um, so, uh, and that helps them see with clarity um, that it's all about um, identity 
Um, well, and it's a way to discuss inequalities and everyone knows that inequalities abound, right? But it's a way to discuss inequalities that right. has nothing to do with capitalism, basically. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if, if you can afford the tuition or if your parents can afford the tuition uh, at such institutions, and, and Cedric and I had a lengthy conversation about this yesterday, in fact, um, then that likely bespeaks a class worldview. But more to the point, even if you don't, um, even, even if you come from a working class or, or poor background and find yourself at such institutions, think about the way the field of economics is taught, or as any said, and, and the things that will be taken for granted passive voice in your econ 101 course, right? Um, and um, this overlaps a, a, a point that, that Denny had made a while back as well about sociology. I mean, the point uh, <laughs> that she'd made about sociology um, and sociological frameworks like race relations uh, and socioeconomic status. Do you, know, you want to take a stab real quick? Yeah, and I would say like also the third thing is where you sit in the class hierarchy and your relationship to publicly public goods, right? So if you feel like you can buy all the healthcare that you need, it becomes a non-issue for you. And so the you know the, the the that allows Joy Reid to say black people. So first of all, she gets to speak for black people in the abstract, and then because she herself has no problem buying healthcare as a commodity, and in fact views it as one of the indexes that she ran the race of meritocracy and won. Because a lot of times the identitarians are deeply invested in the notion of a meritocracy. They just wanted to, the, the impediment of race to be removed. And then the truly great people can all get together and get all the stuff that they deserve as the truly great. So the notion of public goods and the state taking, you know, owing you something and all of that, it doesn't enter their framework whatsoever at all. It is what I have been not denied in my greatness because of what you think of people of my race. Um, and that becomes their definition of a just world where all the super smart people from each race get all the stuff. <laughs> and the devil take the high most. <laughs> I know I, I'm not supposed to do this, but can I add to that with an, an anecdote? Um, because the, this framework has certainly made its way to non-fancy colleges and universities too, right? It's hegemonic at this point. And I can say when I started professoring 20 years ago, one of the things that I liked about where I teach, where, where I teach is that um, my students didn't have the same kind of class privilege. They tended to be middle class rather than affluent. Uh, and it made it a lot less infuriating in some ways, right? Um, but not too long ago, a few years ago, I'd, I'd shared with my students as I'd begun doing about five or six years ago, um, how expensive, how inexpensive public education, public higher education used to be in the United States. And I had mentioned regularly in my, my classes, I've said in many interviews, that um, tuition at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which is not too far from where we are, the flagship institution in the state, when my father, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, George Bush, uh, et cetera, were in college, was about $170 uh, for the entire year. And I think, and that's just tuition, uh, and I think when you, when it was room and board and everything else, it was less than 400 bucks for the entire year. So it's incredibly cheap. And when I said this to one of my, my students, who was a black American woman, she exclaimed utter outrage how effed up that was, which I appreciated. But the interesting thing is where she went with it, because I also shared an anecdote for, of my father's, uh, where he had gone on a public higher ed campaign many years ago. And some young man had suggested at her sinus college uh, that, that the problem with free public higher ed is that it would make for a more competitive workplace. And what my black American student said in response when I shared that anecdote was that too was effed up because that guy didn't want to play on a competitive playing field. This is exactly Zinni's point. And I, I was stunned that this was the reaction that this you know, sharp young woman reflexed with, right? Um, but, but it is worth noting uh, in keeping with what hegemony means that this embrace of meritocracy that's only foiled by racism um, and sexism and homophobia, et cetera, has just transcended all class levels um, among college students, right? I mean, it's transcended class, I think, often enough among college students. 
um, or at least transcended elite. It's made its way from elite universities. It's a better way to put it. It's made its way from elite universities to the universities that educate the masses. Um, and my, my students who come out of union households, so in keeping with, um, to, to slightly correct my, the initial phrasing, my students who come out of union households tend to be much more thoughtful about these things, as, as, how, as I will put it. I have to take this moment to, um, to, to point out something that uh, both Dr. Reed and, and Walter B. Michaels have pointed out um, in reference to all these points with respect to the problem with diversity. The problem with diversity is that it authorizes the view that a society could be just um, where 1% controls 90% of the resources, as long as 50% of them are women, 13% of them are black, and whatever the appropriate percentage is. I should say, when I heard that, it completely ruined my entire dissertation. I had to build it up all over. <laughs> <laughs> and D-Day knows, because I was crying in her office. But <laughs> um, All right, uh, next question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so this got some piggybacks in the chat. So I'm going to ask this question by Kenneth Warren, um, who asked, would any one of you discuss the rhetorical and analytical evasion performed by the term racial capitalism? <laughs> Lamont? No, I, I think that's all you, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's put it to a vote. Uh, and I nominate Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll take the hit because again, it has come to prominence, I think, a lot through sociology. Yeah. And what I think it, it, it references a, th a lot of things I talked about before, where you have to invoke all the right words because one of the ways that you can tag someone as a class reductionist and say it's a bad thing is you say, we got that. It explained everything and this thing is still remaining over. We need to pivot to the, to, to the racial. So racial capitalism is it, next to structural racism. I mean, it was a really, it was a great marketing ploy because what you do is that you say things like, and of course we're gonna look at capitalism. And then you have an analysis that is entirely about discrimination or it's some sort of a notion of always just listing the disparities. And as Dr. Reed Sr. has pointed out so many times to mark a disparity is not an analysis, but it appears to be one in the amongst the racial capitalism crowd. So what I find out, I find in racial capitalism, people will invoke it. There is no theory of property relations in their capitalism. Capitalism essentially is a proxy for the word class, which is a proxy for a demographic characteristic. That is the extent of what they say when they say capitalism or racial capitalism. Frankly, I think that's the best and most succinct response I've ever heard. Um, but uh, um, I'd like to just to take a second. Um, th this kind of uh, you know, builds on that, but it also kind of reaches back uh, um, uh, I mean, to earlier comments, because uh, like everybody's talked about, um, you're getting in the Wayback Machine. And, <laughs> and what one of the ways, uh, well, one thing that strikes me about, you know, the racial capitalism construct, um, w w which is kind of like a gutless version of Afro pessimism, basically, right? Uh, but is that, um, uh, I mean, we noticed in the last 15 years, maybe, uh, at least in you know, beginning with the reparations, when when uh, you know when the reparations idea is kind of crawled back out of the crypt uh, around uh, I mean the turn of the century. Like I was out of the country for a month with no connection to the U.S. and I come back and it's like what what is this brigadoon from like a soapbox in, in, in uh, uh, you know the 125th you know 125th in Linux uh, from 1969, but um, but. But, but I would um, note for everyone, right, for all of us, that, uh, that it's telling that the arguments um, or what, what works in lieu of an argument for, um, for the race first um, line today is to posit um, some, or, or to draw on a simplistic rendition of, um, what seem to be more direct and overt uh, relations of, of the racial hierarchy from before 1965, right? Um, what, even the um, foolishness about the New Deal being 
uh, what I'm having been so racist, uh, the misreading of the purpose of like disfranchisement, uh, what the Jim Crow order was all about um, and abuses in slavery. And I mean, the greatest travesty and well, one of the most telling ones is, um, is um, what's her name, just like, Jim, or the new Jim Crow, right? Because you read the book and she keeps invoking um, you know, the analogy till she gets to the point where even she has to say, well, it's not really. Which then begs the question, well, why, what, what, what's the power of the notion then? And in each of these cases, it comes down to some version of the same thing, that you don't really have an argument that explain or, or to support the contention that everything that affects black people it is about race, as, at least of all at, at, at an historical moment when, when objectively race explains less and less of American inequality, even uh, among black people. So what you have to do is like posit the trans-historical racism, right? Um, and, 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 and argue, it's not even an argument really, uh, but by a chain of associations uh, that seek to connect um, the, um, what, what's, what's still a kind of narrow uh, understanding of, 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 the, of the dynamics of, of the racial hierarchy in Virginia in 1700 even, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you posit that and then you posit another one and, 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 like then, you, and then you reach for another one and sticking always the two in there, and and uh, and see, and, and then you present this in lieu of an explanation, right? I mean, and, and it works. Well, if it's crazy, it works. But 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 I guess the other thing I would say about the racial capitalism thing in particular is that it's it's, it, it's an evasion uh, um, that's a species of the same genus as intersectionality, right? Because it's a way of saying no, no, no. I'm not. No, I'm not saying that it's just race. And of course, right? I, what, I mean, as you said, uh, yeah, of course we understand capitalism, but they don't really, right? But, but there's no analysis, right? There's no historical or 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 I mean, analytical account of what uh, American capitalism is, where it came from, uh, what what its, uh, you know dynamics are, on um, how it operates. Um, so yeah. I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> Can I ask so, a question? Or yeah, sure. the other I don't know if Ken's satisfied, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Paula's question here. Um, what happens when the exploited labor class stunts their own activism and muffles their demands because they ultimately need to work at institutions that punish them for their activism? Um, for example, universities. As Ruth Gilmore says, why doesn't the working class show up on time for the expected protest? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, actually. Yeah, I mean, the Gilmore part, part kind of threw me off. So. Paula, would you, do you want to follow up on that? Sure. Um, I'm trying to ask, basically, in our own contextual setting of Ithaca College, mm. part of the problem is that even though you have a contingent union, even though you might have people who want to identify with the contingent union, mm -hmm. there is fear amongst those who would be the logical people to protest of protesting in, an, in a very uh, confrontational manner towards this elite class, in which case the, this, the managers and the administrators and the Board of Trustees or whoever you know the the expected kind of antagonist would be, but that doesn't actually happen because their fear of retaliation for getting jobs in the academy period mm -hmm. are pronounced, and so yes. then the protest itself doesn't actually sort of manifest in the way one would expect, you know, kind of expect right. from a kind of exploited class. All right, well, I'll say this. I mean. Specifically uh, regarding your your institution, I may be kind of afraid to protest too because you're a president and you're provost or vice president for academic affairs or 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 or, or whatever she is. Both uh, have been descended on by the fiery tongues of all the identitarian categories, right? So 
righteousness is on their side. So there's no telling what 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 they'll do or um, how they might 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 react. But 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 in general, as a practical matter, I mean, we, uh, we have to be flexible enough to target the actions that we try to organize with uh, with, with a realistic understanding of what might in what might impede people from taking part of them, right? And if you have this sense that um, so much of the contingent uh, faculty members, and you know, like being a contingent faculty member is by definition being precarious, um, but that, that, that it being a contingent or that so many of the contingent faculty members won't show for a protest, then maybe the thing to do is think about another kind of action, right? They wouldn't put them under that kind of pressure, right? Because because it doesn't work a lot um, to, to have to hector people um, to uh, you know, participate in in an action that very many of them are are really shy sh sh shy about participating in. Maybe like a prior step would be to try to um, in engage in practices that build a solidarity or that sort of tighten, I mean, uh, in the solidarity um, among the contingent faculty members uh, you know, before calling an action, right, right of that sort. I, mean, I don't know, does that make sense? Yes, it does. I think the, the issue then becomes that those who have a vested interest in remaining part of the institution, like the tenured or the tenured eligible, have a hard time fording the alliance because they essentially are actually invested in also keeping their jobs. So the right. the alliance making makes makes for very difficult work. Right. Yeah. No. I know it's 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 tough all over. I'm telling you, it really is. Um, I mean, look at that Amazon warehouse. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I want to be respectful of the panelists' times. I know I told you all at seven thirty. Um, so, uh, do, do any of the panelists have time for maybe one more question? Is that okay? And if not, feel free to say no. <laughs> okay, uh, James, can we do one more? Sure. Oh, I thought I was on mute. Um, <laughs> so this last, this question, um, I wanted to do a student question, but, um, I know Chris, um, you had a question. Um, do you wanna maybe ask it yourself, Chris Griswold? Sure, let me find it again, which I'm guessing you're trying to do. I, I see it. So, but... Yeah, but basically it's along the lines of where we were talking before about this alignment with identitarian politics versus class-based politics um, and Marxist politics. And throughout our organizing during the semester and last, it, it seems like once we, we start emphasizing the, the, the necessity for class-based and Marxist politics, there's sort of like student interest to an extent disappears. Um, and I'm wondering if you have advice or a prescription of some sort for easing that or for engaging students in meaningful class-based discussions and actions versus just identitarian politics that align with the with the values and intentions of the school. Uh, can I ask you one quick thing as follow up? When you say their interest wanes, do you mean like they're not interested in protesting or they're not interested in working on the particular set of problems that comes up when you are when you orient around a Marxist framework like that, that they're more interested in uh, identitarian protesting? Like I just I want to get really at the what do you mean when you say that their interest wanes? Yeah, I think it's I, I should clarify that I say interest and engagement wanes. And I think it's 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 about what you said. Yeah, it's about uh, interest wanes and in engaging with the issues that arise when you when you when you engage with that class based politics and the the deeper conversations that come up when you when you ask those questions and when you when you ask students and, and others to engage in that way. Um, it's been a struggle to, to find engagement when, when moving past the particular issue of the academic uh, prioritization program uh, into larger conversations about the, the class structure and hierarchical structure of the institution. Well, I mean, can I say one thing? Um, about 25 years ago, like we were pushing a campaign for um, a 
28th Amendment to the Constitution that would guarantee every American right to a job and a living wage. And a friend of mine uh, who taught then at a community college on the boundary between the Bay Area and the Central Valley, right, uh, you know, asked me to make a presentation to her class. And the, and the kids, by and large, went batshit crazy, right, uh, or just you know, revealed what, what they didn't know. Like one uh, what uh, uh, there, there was one young young woman sitting in the back row, and and if looks could kill, like I never would have left the campus, right? And then she says to me, "Well, but what about my my mother? My mother has a small business, and if she had to pay people what was then uh, what uh, what we then calling ten, uh, you know ten dollars an hour, she couldn't afford to stay in business, right?" And and I said to her, "Well." You know, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to play the dozens on you, but I said at the beginning that this is a, a campaign that's not for everybody. But I have to say that if if f fulfilling your dream requires paying other people less than enough to live on, then maybe you should dream a different dream, right? But anyway, that's not the real point. The real point is that 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 almost all of them, except one black guy. Um, who was older and a Gulf War vet, uh, was just full of foolishness about this, right? And I said to my friend after, I said, yeah, I'm not worried, because you know what? Uh, right now, like, they're thinking that, that this community college is, is their foot on the rung of the ladder that's going to make them captains of industry, right? Uh, and in 10 years, I can probably s sign up every one of them. And so, so my point is, it might just be that um, that that um, re recruiting students uh, to activism is like maybe best thought of as uh, you recruiting cadre to be trained and uh, developed for the long haul, right? I mean, I know I couldn't wait to get off the college campus. I even got yeah, I couldn't wait to get off the college campus. And, and <laughs> those are words from a former student political organizer do, right? Um, right, right. You know, yeah. I was going to say something that, that harmonizes a bit with, but but without the bona fides um, of campus organizing. I did my undergraduate in Hampshire College in lovely Amherst, Massachusetts. So there's a little bit of overlap between my undergraduate experience and, and your undergraduate experience. And, it, you know, separated by about 30 years. Um, and um, I had, you know, a nice core of friends who were invested in class analysis, but even back then, uh, one of the frustrating things for me was that few of my, my peers, uh, too few of my peers were. And in fact, even back then, uh, many of my peers tended to coalesce around identity politics, even if it wasn't necessarily referred to as such back then. And in fact, I recall in one of my US history courses, having a conversation or an exchange uh, that where my half of the exchange was uh, or contribution to the class discussion centered on some sort of class analysis about racial inequality uh, by my 19 or 20 year old uh, framework. And one of my classmates said to me in response, people are more than the economy. And I thought and said, cause you know, between brain and mouth, my interlocutor wasn't as good back then. Um, yeah, you can say that if you have a fucking job, right, that pays well, or if your parents can pay your tuition. And what I'm getting at is that, um, and, and the sample, of this echoes what my father was saying, it's college uh, students are transients, right? I mean, it's, this is a stage of life that um, is temporary by definition. Uh, and as, as my father indicated, of course, most people who attend college um, with an eye toward white collar professional employment and perhaps, you know, the more selective or and or expensive the institution, the, the firmer their attachments <laughs> to those aspirations, right? Um, and so again, in keeping with, with what my dad touched upon is it would make sense to think of, um, well, to basically just expect to write off some percentage of your classmates that some of them are actually the enemy Right. I mean, if, if you are invested in a more economically fair society, then again, a, a good percentage of your classmates are adversaries on that front. And that just is what it is. And I, I can't tell you in grad school, which is even worse. I went to Columbia. Um, you know, I, 
the things that students back then would write off, undergraduates would write off as controversial, like a living wage, right? You can't pursue living wage policies because that's controversial. That was always in the Clinton years when I was in grad school. That was, that was the polite way to just dismiss, right? But, but, some, but national health care and a living wage, when people were even talking about it back then, was controversial. So you couldn't talk about it. And that was a clear reflection on both the class positionality of the students themselves, their backgrounds, um, but also their aspirations. So it really is, I mean, post new left, uh, for sure, uh, colleges are a ground for finding a cadre, um, but you should take your efforts off campus. Um, so. And I graduated soon. I was gonna ask uh, Dr. Magabana if you wanted to follow up on that. Sure, I mean, I, I guess the thing also I would add is, um, I feel for students in the sense that in the world they've grown up in is not only a world where like the left has been so shattered, but any kind of like serious discussion about the, so the society in, the, in which they live is so absent that it has, it, it just warps the imagination. I mean, I had a student, Cedric and I both taught her. She was a lovely young woman. And the, her first introduction was thinking about Medicare for all, she kept getting stuck on but how would Medicare for all fix the fact that Serena Williams also almost died when she went into the hospital to have her baby? And what I saw there is that there is a full on assault at all times to undermine the notion of the public goods as, as ultimately being beneficial for creating a broadly equal society and also to struggle for real things in real context. Frankly, saying something, Medicare for all was about as sexy as we got, but things like a living wage, a living wage is not sexy. Abolishing racism or dismantling white supremacy is, it's sexy. It's, un, it's impossible. And it's also squishy enough that you can put any meaning in there. So it can be, and again, I didn't come up with this. I have to say the elder Dr. Reed, Anna DuVarnay getting an Oscar <laughs> is abolishing white supremacy. You know, so-and-so getting into Harvard is abolishing white supremacy. Yeah, a living wage, I guess, but the white working class is pretty racist. Like, it's interesting, like, they're, they're, it's so rhetorically lofty, right? End hate, abolish white supremacy, dismantle structural racism, that asking for uh, things that are incredibly difficult to achieve, but incredibly consequential that can be concretely named. There's just no context for, uh, for asking for those things. And they just, for lack of a better word, they don't feel sexy enough for most people who are engaged in campus organizing. So I guess I would also say with Ture is probably the terrain of struggle would have to be moved off. Because again, it's only in a historical moment that universities become the vanguard of leading social change. Like that's a fairly new, you know, iteration on where the levels of change are going to come from. You know, it seems natural to us because, you know, we all, you know, mostly sit in these places, but I actually don't think the lever of change is really going to come from the universities. The universities will be dragged along kicking and screaming if we ever, you know, ever get to where we want to go, but they are not going to lead, even though people at the universities always feel like they're going to. Can I just amplify one point? And this is taking off from Zinni's point and connecting to, I think, her initial point. There's, there's something oddly um, um, alarming. Uh, that's the word I want. There's something alarming about the fight uh, about anti-racism, uh, at least in its, its current form, right? It's, it's dominant, the dominant understanding of it. And that, that is this, I think people do understand that anti-racism is a progressive project, but the thing that's sort of fascinating, and, and I hope that we all oppose racism, sure. But in keeping with Sydney's point about the squishiness of it, one of the things that I find alarming about it uh, is that the fight against racism is kind of like the war on terror, right? Um, you're fighting perspectives, right? You're fighting attitudes, but what you're not doing is changing the world for the better in a material way. And what's really striking to me about this as a historian, and this is gonna connect to, to Zinni's jumping off point in our opening remarks, is that despite all of the um, 
hype around this, you know, the, 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 the presentation of this project in a kind of militant frame, mm -hmm. it's basically Booker T. Washington, right? I mean, it's basically the politics of respectability actually is what, what this is because the core of what the politics of respectability was comes down to two things, clientage politics and efforts to change white people's, racist white people's attitudes. And you had to change racist white people's attitudes back in the era of the politics of respectability, right? You know, so that's gonna take you more or less, we'll periodize that from Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise Address in 1895 um, to 1932, right? It's gonna change a bit with uh, quite a bit during a, during a new deal, but it was necessary. One of the reasons it was necessary to change white people's minds about, you know, racism, about racism was to open job opportunities um, by way uh, and, and housing opportunities through private action, not state action, but private action, philanthropy, charity, right? And the respectability piece is blacks had to demonstrate that they were acculturable, that they, you know, that black leaders wanted to demonstrate that in a fight against scientific racism, that the differences between blacks and whites were cultural rather than biological, you could say, but that meant that blacks were assimilable or could, could acculturate. And in order, again, to make the case that philanthropists should invest in black housing or to open job opportunities, then black leaders uh, needed to demonstrate that, that blacks could be acculturated. And again, I mean, even though that's a, we understand the politics of respectability to be a an expression of conservative politics, I think most of us do. I think most of us don't really know what it was Right and what the appreciate the context um, and the parameters of of the struggle for for advancement and, and who define that and how. But the fundamental point there was don't don't make a public goods case, don't make a rights case. Um, look to rich white people to improve the material lives of a small stratum of blacks because that's the only way that could happen anyway. It would have to be a small stratum of blacks. And we had to disabuse white people of their racist disposition, right? Um, and it's kind of like the Robin DiAngelo project in, in some ways, um, even as it might not feel like it, but that's basically what it, what it comes down to. And so this is all to say that a lot of what people understand to be a kind of radical statement against racial inequality is actually a kind of throwback <laughs> to a more conservative um, you know, approach. And it's a throwback because the demand should be, as, as any has, has said eloquently many times, for public goods, right? I mean, it's, it's, there should be demands on the state to improve the lives of American citizens and to not do harm to other people who aren't American citizens around the world, I might add. So. And I'd like to add one other really conservative throwback thing to Ray. It's also the respectability politics of if you, the, the one thing standing in the way of you becoming a doctor is you never saw a black doctor. So it's really strange that the oh culture of poverty stuff has come back with the representation matters crowd. Because before yeah. when they're like, oh, it's not that, it's structural. But it's really strange. There's a slip and slide whereby it's, this is important because people don't see people and the favorite is people who look like me, which is the most racial essentially because nobody looks like anybody. Well, you two look alike because you're related. But in terms of the whole people who look like me line, don't do X or if you see it and then we'll have more little kids who do it, which is the most respectability politics of possible respectability politics and totally says you didn't become a doctor because it's freaking expensive. Right. And you know, all of that totally disappears is that I didn't see black doctors, which then gives rise to like the, on the first day of school, you're gonna have a whole bunch of black men in ties. They do this in Hartford, Connecticut to like wave at the kids and put them in the car. Like that has come way, way back with a vengeance that is and, and delivered by black people this time instead of white missionaries. Well, and as it, and as it was with by, um, by uh, President Obama, right? I mean, it's a big part of post-racialism. I almost slipped into my Obama impression, by the way, but that was, <laughs> that was an accident. Uh, and it's, it's an extension of role modeling ideology that yes. was you know, part of uh, you know, the kinder face, I guess, of underclass ideology, but it, 
it does the same work, the very work that you discussed from the start, Zinni, detracting attention from political, economic sources of inequality and treating what are societal problems, right? Um, uh, uh, as if they are individualist in some way, right? Well, and can be, yeah. can be remedied through individuals. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Which, um, what, yeah, the politics of, what the black critics of the politics of respectability during the New Deal right. had pointed, had made this very point that the politics of respectability um, detracted attention from the societal issues and put it back on the shoulders of the individuals themselves. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no, great. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, you go back to the to, to the black doctor thing for a second, uh, because it's like, uh, because, because it's very pertinent. Uh, well, we in, were just talking about that too, not long ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But like, this is like a COVID time. Um, what I mean, version of it, right? Because I'm sure everybody can recall, uh, you know, after the, um, the initial racist bullshit myth, sorry, passed that that new blacks and Hispanics are somehow more susceptible to infection. Once like the demographics caught up with, with the myth, uh, then much more recently you recall that uh, when, when the vaccine came out, mm -hmm. that there was like uh, an uprush of concern and people in white jackets and people on uh, MSNBC ch chairs and elsewhere fretting that because of the legacy of the Tuskegee experiments and 19th century vivisection stories, right? Uh, black people were skittish about getting vaccinated. And I nor anyone else that I knew who, uh, who, who has anecdotal um, comments on this had seen anything at all like that. And if anything, uh, depending on where you were, Black people, on average, seem to be a little more uh, respectful of the protocols of, of uh, your distancing and stuff than a lot of white people were because they knew that they were more susceptible because of the jobs that they worked and where they lived and they didn't have health insurance and so forth and so on and figured that, 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 that this virus was nothing to play with. Well, turns out that after a whole lot of money gets produced from the government from, 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 from nonprofits, from the medical establishment to uh, uh, fill in, create and fill in like a layer of black functionaries who get paid um, to, keep, uh, to keep the bears away from, from, uh, from, uh, um, uh, from Springfield and the Simpsons, <laughs> that it turns out that black people get vaccinated at, the, at exactly the same rate as everybody else, right? But and, but even in the face of that evidence, right, right, the mythology persisted, right? And people are still today talking about, uh, and, um, and, and, and I'm sure you know, within a week, there'll be another article about it on The Root, um, how, how black people carry in, in their DNA um, trauma from, from Tuskegee. And, and not to mention, even get the Tuskegee case wrong, but still that's another matter. But yeah, but but I mean, here we are, and 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 it just sort of connects like the role modeling ideology with the uh, but wait, you got to pay me because I'm because uh, I'm a racial voice ideology. <laughs> and it actually turned out the people who didn't want to get vaccines were white male Republicans. Right, that's <laughs> right. Nobody bothered to investigate, like it was, which would make sense given their leader, who they had actually elected, right. said, "Don't wear a vaccine or right. do a mask," and they right. followed their popularly elected leader and did what he did. Instead, people who had not lived through Tuskegee, and they even had an older woman on, like an NPR, an old black woman, she was like, "I wanted to get it, we didn't have any," right. and she was like, "I don't even know that much about Tuskegee. Anyone I know who didn't get the vaccine was because." We couldn't get it. Like it, we, right. there was an access issue. So right. that was also that really weird thing that your racial legacy determines your behavior right. far more than your immediate circumstance. And that's that train that leads to Auschwitz. <laughs> exactly. Next stop. Right. <laughs> Oof, well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the ice skating video. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists, Dr. Uh, Reed Jr., Dr. Reed, and my advisor, Dr. Magubani, <laughs> for participating. Thanks again to all the co-sponsors and the organizers. And, and of course, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Miranda for helping organize us. Thank you so much.